Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part six of our cystic pancreatic lesions. I have not checked the records, but I don't think we've ever done a part six in anything. I know I've done five parts, surely done a bunch of fours and threes and twos and ones, but in the 15 or 20 years of doing these talks, we've never done a six-parter. But hey, why not? Anyway, we left off last time mentioning lymphopathelial cysts. It's one of the things that's often left off the list of cystic pancreatic lesions, but it's an uncommon lesion. It's typically low CT attenuation arising from the pancreatic gland. And one of the key things, it seems to come off the surface of the gland. It often appears exophytic. It can be large, so it can be mistaken as cystic lesions arising from adjacent organs like spleen or kidney or mesentery or even stomach. It's often unilocular and thin-walled without internal septations or solid components. In this article we wrote about cystic pancreatic lesions, uh, we spoke about prospective diagnosis can be extraordinarily difficult, although these lesions do tend to be peripancreatic rather than truly of pancreatic origin. If a lesion is suspected to be extrapancreatic rather than arising from the pancreas itself, lymphopathelial cysts should be considered. Now, one of the things we've often seen, if you tissue sample lymphopathelial cyst, patients often get really bad pancreatitis. Now, here's some examples. Again, when you look at this quickly, is it pushing on the gland or coming from the gland? If it's from the gland, you also would think about you know, an IPMN. Probably not. It's kind of large. I don't see duct. Uh, you think about a serous cyst adenoma, perhaps an MCN as well as lymphopathelial cysts would all be good possibilities. So would a spend type tumor as well. You can see on this image the way it's kind of scalloped. So sometimes the coronal views can be very helpful, showing you that kind of scalloped appearance. And here it is with this cinematic rendering and volume rendering, where the scallop presentation will be shown. These two are just the volume rendering. But again, the scalloped appearance which again is shown better on the cinematic. So often the post-processing can help you. I think the hardest way to diagnose a uh, lymphopathelial cyst probably is looking only at the axial images. Here's another lesion by the head of the pancreas at a quick glance. You could even consider an IPMN coming off the uncinate. You see it better on the coronal view. But again, it's a challenging lesion because this could surely be an IPMN, it could be an MCN, it could be an oligocystic uh, serous cyst adenoma as a possibility. And this was a lymphopathelial cyst. So I think lymphopathelial cysts are benign lesions, of course. There's no malignant potential, but they can be a very much mimicking other lesions. And that may be the reason they get resected, just because there's concern for maybe it's being something else. They do not rupture, they do not bleed if left alone, and they do not cause problems. So again, lymphopathelial cyst. Now, I've shown you lots of cases, and I've tried to go through some of the key parameters that help us distinguish between the various different lesions. We look at age, we look at sex of patients, we look at the appearance of the lesion, we look at its size, its enhancement pattern, head, body, or tail. Are they single? Are they multiple? Multiple, you're typically talking about IPMNs. Is it vascular rim enhancement? Then we're thinking about a neuroendocrine tumor, though we could be talking about an MCN as well. If the patients are young, we talk about um, the fact the patient could have a uh, spend tumor. So there's lots of things we look at. But I think one of the things that we have done some work on and other people are doing some work on is can AI improve the three things we're looking at? Detection, classification, and management. Can AI be helpful in having less patients be biopsied or less patients go to surgery? Can AI be helpful in determining who has low grade versus high grade lesions? We may need to do nothing. In this article by Chu talking about classification of pancreatic cystic neoplasms, looking at radiomics, accuracy of radiomics-based cyst classification compared to experienced radiologists. In 214 cases, the, uh, the AUC was better for the radiomics 
than it was for the radiologist. Improved diagnostic accuracy can potentially maximize the efficiency of healthcare utilization. In this article published in 2022. In this article by Chu, uh, made the point that um, a wide range of cystic lesions can have overlapping appearances and there is a challenge. And so uh, that's how we had different radiologists do things. And the conclusion was radiomics-based learning achieved equivalent or better performance than the best radiologists. So again, uh, we're talking this paper is very important and shows us the direction we're going. And we've put a lot of work into looking at cystic lesions and helping with management, looking at lab values, looking at potentially genomics, and with Microsoft, seeing if we can predict who does need surgery, who does need follow-up, and who can be dismissed from follow-up. So again, it's not just detection of lesions, but it's management. And as we mentioned, if every lesion is treated with nine years or 10 years of follow-up, and it doesn't affect management, it's a very, very expensive way of doing things. In this article, again, the idea about talking and looking at larger series of patients, multiple sites, radiomics always has the challenge of reproducibility, but I think it's something that becomes very important. And just a few features and factors to note how we do the radiomics, you segment out the individual lesion, we use first order and second order features, we use random forests and other classifiers, and then we're able to basically determine precisely what that lesion is. What's nice also about using AI, it doesn't list things as could be this, could be this, could be this. It's not giving a differential. It's giving one thing, and it's been very accurate. With physicians, it's much harder because you end up with a differential diagnosis, which can range from benign to malignant. In this article by Berbis, radiomics of pancreatic CT and MR images has enhanced pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma detection and its differentiation from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, chronic pancreatitis, and autoimmune pancreatitis. Radiomics can further help to better characterize incidental pancreatic cystic lesions, accurately determining benign from malignant IPMN. So you can see other articles now, this is 2024, have reached the same conclusion. Radiomics and AI are promising techniques that allow the development and validation of cancer biomarkers and the building of predictive models. And that indeed is very, very important. And in the pancreas, radiomics contribute to the accuracy of the diagnosis, prognosis, and prediction of pancreatic cancer. And it's different differentiation from healthy tissue and other pathologies. Although still limited by the scarcity of studies with good methodologic quality and the methodological difficulties inherent associated with deep learning algorithms, we can expect a bright future for radiomics in these fields, presumably brought about by the fast development of high-performance computers, hello NVIDIA, and DL tools and the increasing availability of higher volumes of clinical imaging data sets. And something we know, we need more data, we need to test it on different scanners, different protocols, and see how good we really can do with radiomics and can it translate from place to place. place. And here was an article talking about differentiating cirrus cystic neoplasms and mucinous with a deep learning network and you can see very high sensitivity and specificity in this article by Yang. And again, their purpose was to differentiate those two lesions. And in a few talks ago, I made the point about how difficult and how overlapping serous and mucinous tumors can be. They used a random forest classifier. And again, their conclusion was this technique was an effective model for being able to separate both the two tumors. So again, you can see that AI is going to play a major role with radiomics and with deep learning in this process. Uh, in this article by Galuza, Cystic Pancreatic Neoplasms, What We Need to Know in New Perspectives, the authors do say the combination of AI and genomics may encourage a further evolution of personalized medicine, Several studies have, therefore, also focused on radiogenomics in pancreas oncology. So again, 
we're looking at many different things, genetic alterations, stromal content. We're looking at AI, and AI can put the imaging and the genomics together, and that indeed is very exciting. Um, and the, uh, the authors did mention that other articles, including that by Chu, demonstrate the high potential these techniques in do have, and again, how even with distinguishing between different cystic lesions and comparing it to radiologists, you can see it does better than radiologists already. Imagine as it gets better and better, and it starts combining the lab values with cytology, with serology, with radiomics, putting it all together, we're going to have a really very strong technology that can non-invasively, or for the most part non-invasively, really predict exactly how to manage patients and the things we said before, who needs to be operated on, who needs to be followed, who needs to be dismissed. All of this can be done better. And again, there are challenges, there's no doubt about it with radiomics, but important steps to bring radiomics into clinical practice are the establishment of a single acquisition protocol and the conduction of multi-center prospective studies. So for example, we just got a new uh, photon scanner, which is great, but there's so many ways you can change the data, the filters, and everything else. If you keep changing all of these numbers, the radiomics doesn't work. So again, with radiomics, you may have to acquire a certain data set or reconstruct it a certain way for radiomics to work. You may do other reconstructions, but you don't use them for the radiomics. So it's going to be a learning thing. So concluding then, cystic pancreatic neoplasms represent a range of pathologies with varied and in some cases controversial management. Think about IPMNs, think about changes in management, like with MCN, think about how we deal with neuroendocrine tumors now, particularly small ones, where we follow rather than resect. There is considerable overlap in CT appearance of different pathologies. However, if the lesion has the classic appearance, say of a serous adenoma, surgery can typically be avoided unless the patient is symptomatic. We also, as I mentioned, are thinking about how good size criteria really are for MCNs and neuroendocrine tumors. Does a one size fit all where everybody gets resection the right method? The answer is probably not. Uh, Multi-detector CT and CTA and 3D mapping help define lesion characteristics, including internal septations, nodularity, and relationship to the ductal system better than we've ever been able to do, which may aid in diagnosis and subsequently guide patient management. And many lesions require surgical resection due to diagnostic uncertainty, but hopefully in time, the number of patients who go to surgery will decrease. In the article that's being published between the work of Microsoft and Hopkins looking at cystic pancreatic lesions, we decreased the number of patients who went to surgery by more than half. So that indeed is very impressive. Again, things we look at, things we look for, we look at spend tumors as younger patients, we look at serous cyst adenomas as older patients, but again, lots of overlap. And so when you're reading the cases, you can go by the rules that are tried and true, but you're going to be wrong because the rules at times just don't, tumors don't follow the rules. But I think if you listen to this talk, think about all the various tumors and then put this into play the next time you're doing a case, I think you're going to do very well. If you need to see lots of cases, go to CT as Us, go to the pancreas section, you're going to see lots of cystic pancreatic neoplasms, and I hope that's helpful as well. And with that, part six is over, and I hope everybody has a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.